June 14th Council Work Session and meeting. Please rise for a moment of silence. And let's remember Councilman Gerard's sister, Joan Ritter, who passed away uh, last month. I please salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Gerard and Mr. Catrochi are on vacation. Mr. Peza is at his son's kindergarten graduation. Mrs. Cullen had a procedure done today. And Mr. Saxon has a doctor's visit in King of Prussia that he could not cancel because he waited a long time to get on their schedule. So right now we do not have a quorum to vote on anything, but we can conduct a council meeting. I don't think there's anything that we need to vote on tonight, or I would have canceled the meeting for next week, but I don't want to keep canceling meetings, so we're doing the best we can. Mr. Dillon, you want to do a roll call, please? Mr. Gerard, Mr. Devine. Here. Mr. Pezza, Ms. Cullen, Ms. Rodriguez. Here. Mr. Gorman. Present. Mr. Trochi. Mr. Dietrich. Here. Okay, so... Glad to welcome everybody back. It's the first meeting we have publicly since COVID. So the doors are open again. I'm glad to see a packed house tonight. It's very nice to see a lot of friendly faces. So I'm going to open up the meeting with public participation. So anybody on this side of the room would like to speak on anything, go to the podium, state your name and address. Anybody doing a presentation, just sit there until we get done with everything else. Hi, um, my name is Melissa Redmond. I live in the North Ward. Um, I wanted to come and speak tonight on topic number four to amend to prohibit the feeding of feral cats. Um, I would like to counsel to consider to not prohibit the feeding of all feral, cat, feral cats, but to instead adopt the language that is in the codes of Philadelphia and also Middletown Township. Um, these codes state that you can feed feral cats, but they have to be sterilized and the colonies need to be managed. So this is for a number of reasons. Um, I care about the cats, but I also care about the feeders of these cats. To be honest, we all know that the people are not going to stop feeding the cats. So what you're going to do is be punitive to the residents. You're going to be imposing fines. Um, many of the feeders are retired, senior citizens, things like that. So all you're doing is really fining already vulnerable people. Um, but the feeders do have a responsibility to maintain their colonies and get the cats fixed. Um, I did watch the meeting from last, well, not last month. At this point, it was months ago. And there was a mention made about new cats coming in if you remove the cats that's real that's a thing called the vacuum effect there's been scientific studies and things like that on the vacuum effect so removing the cats will not be effective this um amendment will not be effective to prohibit the feeding of feral cats is not effective what you guys should really consider is to prohibit the feeding of unmanaged colony cats that are not fixed you can't wish these cats away if you stop feeding them they will still exist they're not going to disappear because you don't feed them that's not realistic and what's going to happen is people are going to feed them in secret they're not going to get assistance to fix them they're going to be reproducing urinating on your property and other things like that so the benefits of tnr which is trap neuter return is what is already going on a little bit um, but the borough is going to spend money to implement these fines with police activity and administrative activity, following up, finding people, whatever else is going on, that costs dollars. When really you could be proactive instead of reactive, and you could invest those dollars into TNR programs and assist the colony caretakers in getting the cats fixed. So 
Um, Feline Friends is a nonprofit that already exists. The Bridge Clinic is a clinic that already exists. PAWS is another clinic that already exists. And these programs are active in other areas, such as Ben Salem and Philadelphia. And they are successful. So, uh, in, oh, did you have a question? Sure. Just so you know, we are involved with all these programs. And we are the feral cats. Matter of fact, I think Joanne is here. Is she here? Yeah. Joanne is our cat person. She's been dealing with this for like five years. So we're not trying to stop feeding cats. We're having issues with some people having 15, 20, 30 cats. And they're creating an issue where, Joanne, you want to come up and speak on this? So maybe we Well, can... I spoke with Joanne before okay. the meeting. So what I'm just saying would be a good idea is to alter the language and not say, you know, it's a free-for-all, but it's the prohibiting of feeding unmanaged colonies and unsterilized cats. I think all we're doing tonight is discussing some of this. Uh, there's nothing etched in stone. Yeah, so this is my feedback. Thank you. Comment. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the question I have is, you mentioned something about un... I forgot what you said about the un... Unsterilized, so... Yeah, the, how, how is a person who's a feeder supposed to know which one's sterilized and which one isn't? So, trap to return is like a widely implemented thing across the country. Um, when a cat gets spayed or neutered and released, right? they clip their ear. Oh, okay. um, and then when the cats are spayed and neutered, you see a significant reduction in the negative behaviors, the fighting, the kittens, the urinating, and things like that. So what I would like to see happen um, is encouraging feeders to have managed colonies. So why don't you do me a favor and sure. talk to Joanne, maybe between the two of you, come up with language to present us in July, and sure. we'll act on it then, and we'll table this today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. thank you. Anybody else on this side of the room want to speak? Nobody on this side of the room? Anybody on this side of the room? He's going to speak later. Oh, that okay. ends public participation. Michael, what do you have? Um, just a couple things. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I just wanted to just mention to people that Issues like the lights that are out, the trash, potholes, weeds, anything like that, absolutely uh, it's fine to contact your councilman. But in the meantime, the best thing, the way, the best way to do that is if you could please email. If you email, there's a record, there's a paper trace. I would always email the borough manager first and then your local council person. It's just a, a much more effective and quicker response for just to let everyone know that on channel 33 Verizon are all the emails and the web page on channel 965 is Comcast. And of course, you could visit the borough's website anytime. It just expedites things quicker, faster, and there is a uh, paper trace. So all well, an email trace. Um, I think that's it. And then I just encourage everyone now that we're all back, if you're walking and you see some trash or whatever, maybe just pitch in. Uh, you know, everybody's trying to get. We're trying to get everything back with weeds and things like that. Just take. Uh, you know, if you see something, take a few moments a week or the weekend, and maybe just you know, clean up around your area if you can until we catch up with the street sweeper and all. That's about it. Thank you very much. Betty. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the West Ward uh, for your continued support. I really do appreciate it. Um, I also would like to bring up Otter Street Park. Uh, one of the neighbors contacted me and I did go down there. I don't know why, but the swings are up too, too high. I don't know if the chains were cut to redo them, but I know kids that are taller than me, and I'm only five one. They can't get on the swing because the swings are way too they're way too high. And even the baby swing, like you have to really like put the baby in and hope that the baby doesn't fall out. We need to fix them. They're way too high, and we need some more mulch there. It's really bumpy. Um, second of all. Um, I would like to see a children at play sign on that street where the soccer field is because we have traffic coming from 
Burlington, they cut through Maple, Locust, Linden, Swain, and it comes the other way too. It's like a cut through. And we have a lot of children in that area. And a lot of people are concerned that these people are just flying through to try to beat the stop signs or whatever. I know this is a constant problem. I know the chief did get in touch with someone and they are working on it, but I'd like to see us try to stay on top of that. Um, and of course the children at play sign. Uh, on Bear Street, some of the sweeper signs, there's nothing on them. They're, they're white. They're so we trying need, to get caught up and make a lot of Yeah, I know we've sure. been behind, but I think it's time to try to get them replaced. So I'm bringing it up now. Um, we also had an incident on 600 baths with the sewer. For a whole week, it's dumping out into the sidewalk. So if we can, I know I sent Mr. Dillon an email today and John, but if we can get someone to go see why that's happening, it's nasty. We don't need that. Uh, the SEPTA bridge on Bear Street, there's graffiti on it. And it, it seems like one night they did one side and the other night they did the other side. It looks like they're going to keep doing it. Um, let me see. And then I also wanted to congratulate Ms. Sophia Arroyo. Um, she's a young lady who, this is her fifth annual Alex Lemonade Stand. And she, her goal was 1500 but she exceeded it to $2,018. Nice. Uh, it's on neighbors, helping neighbors, if anybody still wants to give. But it's always great to see your kids in town trying to do for others. We all love that. On that note, I'd like to say let's all pray for the Clegg family. They used to live in Bristol. They moved out of Bristol. I don't personally know them, but from seeing what I see, they've lost a child this weekend. And we all know that can be really traumatizing. And that's it. Thank you. Chief, do you have anything? I'm sorry. I'd like to report for we have two, uh, two we had our 77 incidents called in for from Bucks County requiring uh, police response. As I kept most of the people in the ward that was concerned with the fence in place issue regarding the uh, residents we had up there um, maintaining, uh, I don't know how to put it, but trying to take care of the individual that is in that residence and deserves the care that he needs to receive at the same time trying to, not to make a police response issue. But we're still actively involved in that. Uh, hopefully some of you have noticed the bike patrols have been out. We've tried something different also. We actually have officers on foot patrol. They've hit some of the streets. Uh, and we'll continue to do that whenever we can and resources allow. High school graduations this week, so again, parents just be in tune to your children. So uh, we had one tragedy in the northern end of the county already. Let's not have any down here. Um, we're allowing the high school drive. That was a request that came in, the same as last year, the 11:30 on Thursday. Uh, we'll come down Pond Street, down Mill Street, down Radcliffe. So uh, Michael, if you can get the business owners out, 11:30 that morning. Mm -hmm. We got the upcoming June tea cel uh, celebration this Saturday that we're looking uh, forward to. And lastly, uh, we re um, reactivated the, gun the BENS uh, program regarding the uh, gun safety lock program with the uh, Bristol Cares Coalition for Gun Violence and Gun Prevention Violence. Ourselves, the Township Police and the Bucks County District Attorney's Office with the coalition. We just put them back out there again. Anybody has a uh, issue that they need a firearm lock to secure a firearm, um, we have them for free at headquarters. And that's it. Any questions for the chief? Tony. Yeah. Chief, the only question I have is I know it's happened in other parts of the borough, but in the North Ward, do we have any officers yet that are trained with the uh, tractor trailer so they can inspect tractor trailers? I know that we've been nice kind of helping these guys. I mean, I myself have helped maybe three or four of them already, you know, back, back out of streets. They shouldn't be turned down to whatever circumvent going on 13, but I, I, we have to do something different because now it's like it's, they're affecting the roads. They knock down a sign. They're, you know, we have some patchwork that's going on those side streets that, you know, those heavy trucks. Fortunately, we have one officer, um, John Allen, who um, 
works for uh, the actual state doing truck enforcement, which kind of is a good way helps us and in a bad way doesn't help us because the availability is limited. We just started a program with them. We're putting them out on certain times when it's available. There's certain aspects when you stop a truck, believe it or not, that you have to have in place. You have to have a printer in the vehicle because you have to take a copy of their logbook and all those things. Because to be honest with you, we can hit them with the $25 going down the street routine problem. That's not really, we want to really kind of put the, um, uh, the message out there. If you're coming into town and you screw up, or at least you're going to get inspected, which is really going to, it's your pocketbook and also maybe pay a little bit more attention. But yeah, you do have a little bit of a plan in place. I'm hoping it works. All right, that's it. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Devine. Yeah, I have some things. Um, the first thing I was talking about was the cement apron. Mr. Dillon, I know that we have patched that before. There's a cement, I don't even know if it's the correct term, but turning on Beaver Street onto Mansion, where it goes from the blacktop to concrete and then blacktop. I, I have people that stop in front of my house, I would say at least once a week, that tell me that that is doing something to their car. I'm not really sure exactly how it works, but they're saying when they go, it dips down and it scrapes, they're scraping the bottoms of their car. So they're asking, if, is there a permanent fix instead of the cold patch that we've been putting on there so we could kind of even those services out? This is at Beaver at Mansion? This is Beaver and Mansion, turning left on Beaver. I'm sure there's other ones on there because I'm looking as I was driving over today. And it looks like, you know, a, a couple of the streets are the same way where it's on Beaver Street, it's blacktop. Then when you turn on the street, there's like a cement portion and then blacktop again on the street. So I guess where the blacktop and the concrete. On that Gilmore. <clears throat> All right, the next one, we did that to Chief. Uh, the next one, there's a, uh, a resident in the, actually, I don't even know if he's in the North Ward, but um, he's, he's handicapped and he uses a wheelchair and he plays wheelchair basketball. And he reached out to me to let me know that there is no ramp that goes to the basketball courts from the parking lot or from the trail for him to get onto the court. Right now we're putting in from the parking lot down to the courts, mm -hmm. a six foot wide paved area once we paved the, the parts of the path that need to be paved. Okay. That There's gonna be another part put in on the East Circle or West Circle. When you say another part, what's that mean? Another paved area. That'll lead into the courts? No, it'll lead up to the path. Well, he needs it to go from the path. Like, if he uses his wheelchair to go down the path and he wants to get onto the basketball court. Well, he's got to go down the path. Yeah. To Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Come up Jefferson, come down into the court area, and then go down this new ramp that we're making. Okay. So why can't we build a, a small ramp? That would be just right off the path, so you can come off the path right to the courts. Well, we'll let them look at it. Just so everybody knows, we did pave the, all the courts are redone, the bridge has been redone, so everything that I have talked about over the last several months has been completed, except the the path. We still need some areas to be patched. So, what what time frame do you think we could have on getting that taken care of? I have no idea, Mr. Devine. Right now, it's so hard to get people to do anything. It's what was the cost of it to repave those uh, the baseball courts? They do look good. Yeah. No idea. All right. Um, do we have any further plans for those baseball courts, like lights, a new fence? No, we took the fence down because they cut holes through the, f the fence that was there. Why would we put a new fence up? Um, That's, we all discussed that at a meeting. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, I mean, those, there's been holes in those fences since I was kids. I mean, as, when they were tennis courts. But every time you put up, we fixed it. Every time we fixed the fence, somebody cut a new hole in it because they didn't want to walk around. So it just didn't make sense to keep them up anymore. Well, for the, I, I understand the part of it, but 
when you're playing basketball and you know somebody isn't that great at shooting or a, a shot gets punched out into the into the grass and it goes rolling into the crick and weeds is there something that we could put there it doesn't have to be a fully fenced in area but you know some partially fenced in like even further back just so the balls or whatever they're not going so when we discussed this at our last meeting mm -hmm. and we said the borough workers were going to take down all the poles and the mm -hmm. fence why didn't you bring that up because now it'll probably cost us 10 times the amount to reinstall new poles and everything to put fence up. How, how much more is it going to cost us, did you say? Ten Probably times about more? Ten times more, because all we had to do is put up some chain link to cover the holes. Well, because until it's done, I've, I was under we'll the impression... We'll get a price on it and bring it back to yeah, you. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have to be a full fence. It'll just be something that's going to... And all know. the trash that was on the courts was being collected along the fence. So, but we'll get a price. I know, I was in there and I collected it, but... The thing about it is that gets blamed on kids, and it's not always I'm the not kids. Not blaming anybody. I didn't say you were. I said in general. All right, we'll get All you right. a price. And then the, the second part of that is this, and I and I like that the community gardens there. I think they do a wonderful job there, but it's still the idea that was that area should be accessible for the kids. So now, for safety reasons, kids that when that ball goes over that fence, and if nobody is in the uh, the the uh, planted the 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 garden area. Now these kids are climbing at I don't even know how tall that fence is, but 12 foot fence, and jumping over that fence to get that ball. So they have no access to get that ball. So I mean, is is there a way that you know they're going to be able to leave that that, that gate open so these kids can go in there so nobody falls and breaks their neck? I'll look into that. What else? Nothing for that. Gee, I just told Mr. Dillon to look into that. Oh, okay. Um, and the, the the problem that I have with the area itself, and I shouldn't say the problem is just I don't understand why we we sold the skating rink, which was our recreation area that we had probably three years left to pay for and we and, and we took a, a major hit a seven million dollar hit for the taxpayer then the little bit of money that we had left over 150 grand instead of putting it back in for our kids or other rec opportunities for the residents instead we're going to use 150,000 to build uh i don't even know what they are outlook decks onto the, the marsh areas, like, why would we want to do that? Why would we want to take 150,000 that we, that, that we... Well, we're taking 150,000 to build that. What do you mean, I read we it. We built, we did the bridge. You said... Uh, we took that 150,000 so far, we, we built a new bridge, which is recreation, people use that to walk, right? We did the tennis courts the basketball courts with some of that money. We are repaving the path and all the sections that are bad with that money, which is recreation. And there are people that enjoy going down the river to use them lookout towers as recreation. It's not just dribbling a basketball. Nobody said it was just dribbling a basketball. There's other opportunities besides dribbling a basketball, but I would, I would There's say- There's still money left, so whatever you want to do, let us know. All right. So anyway, that 150,000 was in this packet somewhere. I'll find it for you. But that's where I came up with it, and I said the 150,000. Know what he's talking about? No, but I'll find just like I usually find. Mr. Dillon. Oh, those uh, outlooks were uh, dangerous. Uh, we had to shut them down before somebody would get hurt. Burrow would probably get sued. So uh, we looked at it as passive recreation. And uh, we bought the wood, and uh, our fellows in-house, especially John Driscoll, uh, replaced two of them, brand new. They're beautiful, and uh, and I think we were obligated because of the uh, the Nature Conservancy uh, has a deed on there, and they told us we had to get them fixed also. So. 
All right. Well, it just seems like to me that's a, a not a very strong case for recreation when we talk about kids and people using it in the community. Well, like I think it's passive recreation. Well, I understand. Timers. Uh, yeah, I understand how you want to uh, use it. And can walk up on there and look out at the freshwater marsh. Yeah. Well, to me, uh, it, it seems like something that you would be able to get in a grant. I mean. Mr. DiGiuseppe and yourself have no problem being able to, you know, find grants for the for that area for Tony. We the only river. bought the material. It wasn't like we spent, you know, hundred thousand. I don't think we spent ten thousand dollars on redoing these. But I'm, I'm only going by what I what I read in the You're packet about hundred and fifty thousand. Oh, I'm sure I am. Well. We'll Just like I read, well, we did the same thing when we talk. You make it sound like it's something that's going to be great for the taxpayer because we're going to do it in house. The same way we did the wharf down there in house, it cost us over two hundred thousand dollars. If that would have went out the bid, somebody would have did it for less than that. Less than our borough workers can do it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What did they do? It's a, it's a. It looks great. It that's does, I'm not saying it doesn't, but it didn't have to cost over two hundred thousand. Well, I don't know where to get your numbers, but that's fine. What do you mean? I'll show them to you, too. All right. Um, the next question I have, um, I don't know what we have in the capital improvement, but we spent a lot of money on Elm and Chestnut uh, and other different areas in the borough. We spent a lot of uh, time and energy down by Mill Street. And we have a, a parking issue that I, I thought would be a good idea if we took some of the abandoned areas that are in the North Ward, specifically I know there's one on Garden Street, there's an open lot on Spruce Street, another lot I think is on, I don't know if it's the corner of Pine and Plum Street Alley, but if we can make some pocket parking, if we could use some of that capital improvement to buy, you know, those open lots and then turn it into some pocket parking for the residents in those areas. What do you think about that idea? It's a good idea throughout town. Yeah, I have one on my street. we got to get the money to do it. All right. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Dillon for taking care of that sign on Mansion and Inlet that was knocked over. Uh, I don't even know when that was, Mr. Dillon. That could have been a month and a half ago, maybe. But thank you for getting that done. Um, the SEPTA rail station, the facelift, great idea. This is also that can be happening. The, the issues, I shouldn't call them issues, just the, the, the thing that kind of strikes me is that we have the ability to get SEPTA out there to be able to, you know, talk about a facelift and they're going to spend a lot of money. But for the past probably four or five years, people in the North Ward, especially on Garden Street, have been dealing with the jungle that is, you know, it's it's out of control, and it seems like something that should have been been handled and could have been handled by us. But we wanted to use the, you know, like it's not our property. We, you know, we can't do anything. Except that won't, you know, or Amtrak, whoever owns that property, is not going to let us do it. But it, it just, you know, it, it just seems like. It, it was something that that could have been taken care of. And the other question is, what, when Danny Pashula was running, you made it sound like he was the person that had the connection for SEPTA and having these big weeks to get this done. But the problem that I have with it is it's something that you always knew and you were working on in, in the background because it's your connections that get it done. But why is it that you have to not be transparent with the people of the North Ward and about what? About you know when things are done. Like if you have if you have something in in the works to have set their air track come out there. Why can't you just be open up front, talk to me and Dave as the North Ward council people? We so don't. We I try. told you before. Me and you don't work together. No, I know, but and I, I don't want to talk to you about any projects. Right, I understand that, but you no. don't want to talk to anybody about any projects, and that goes. That's fine. I do the, the best I can to try to get something done. Right, I understand that. All but right. what I'm saying is, I, I just want people to understand that. I mean, 
if it's going to be a monarchy or a dictatorship, the people just have to understand it. I mean, if they're okay with it, then there's no reason for us to waste our time. If, if, you're, if you're the person that makes all the calls and all the decisions and nobody else needs to be involved, why waste everybody else's time up here? I'm not wasting your time. No, you are, because, I mean, if you're not willing to work because, I mean, you have a, a certain feeling, you know, a personal feeling that you have against You're saying against I shouldn't me. contact anybody to try to get anything done? No, it's just the same way, like, the you Mill Run work. Project. Can I just say something, Mr. No, Ryan. wait, let me finish. It's just like the Mill Run Project, is that you make it look like it was, you know, Mr. Peasant and Ms. Cullen that is, you know, spearheaded it. But it has nothing to do with them because they don't even know what's going on over there. And at our last meeting, it's comical to me that Lorraine Cullen would bring up, she spoke to Bob White, and Bob White assured her any issues that they have there, he will make sure they will be taken care of. And there was another resident that was just walking in, 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 in the East Ward and recognized Mr. White was at the, at the Mill Run property multiple times, yet you have no clue why he's there. To me, that's, that's, that's you being deceptive. That's you being not transparent. So what is the reason you would act like you don't know why Bob White is at Mill Run? I don't know why he's there. <laughs> what I got? I don't because ask. it's comical, Ralph. Because why? you know everything that goes on in the borough, but not that. Okay. It don't, doesn't make sense, that's all. But you don't have a problem with Dave Gerard. So even if you have a problem with me, you could reach out. Dave is a great person. Dave is a nice guy that you don't have problems with. You could reach out to Dave and let Dave know so he could talk to the people of the North Ward and let them know what's going on. Um, the mayor and fire chief is a big one. So I guess that that's going to be an issue that we're not going to talk about. So I'm going to read a letter I'm to going to, Let me just interrupt you. Go ahead. There's nothing to discuss regarding the fire chief. It's a personnel issue, and it's not going to be discussed on this floor. Okay. So any Says comments who? you have about him? Says who? Says you? No. We Says should who? not be discussing anything with personnel on this floor. Okay. I'm saying Executive from who? Session who's saying issue. it? Mr. Solani, you want to explain to him? You don't have to explain. Just tell me who's making, who's saying that I can't talk about it. I'm saying it. All right. And what are you saying, Mr. Solani? I'm saying Solani? that if you discuss anything on the floor about personnel, mm -hmm. you could end up jeopardizing the borough's position and harming the borough. Okay? So this is personnel. All right? We understand that whatever the issue is, the mayor has reached out to the township and is trying to address it. Okay? And if it has to come to the borough at some point, We'll discuss it in an executive session, and if a vote needs to be taken, we'll take it on the floor. But it's not to be discussed in public. Okay, well, okay. I'll take my chances. You will? Yeah, I'll take my chances. So I'm going to discuss the, 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 the situation that we have, right? And this is what happens in this borough, right? Everything is covered up because of incompetence. There's no way, I'm not going to go into specifics of things, but listen, when you have five fire chiefs from outside of the borough that come from the township, that does not happen every day letting you know, because to me, it's not the personnel that I'm worried about, okay? It's the firefighters that I'm worried about. It's the residents of the town that I'm worried about, okay? So if the personnel, somebody gets their feelings hurt, too bad. I don't care. What I do care about is that we have people in place that know what the heck they're doing, right? And clearly, from five fire chiefs in an adjoining township, feel very strong about it. So it affects the residents of this town. So eventually, what basically what they're saying is something bad is going to happen, either to a firefighter or a resident. So. You could do what you want, and you could say, and you can try to quiet everybody down if you'd like to, okay? It'll all come out eventually anyway, and guess what? The people here who are okay with it are the ones that got to deal with it. You got to look yourself in the mirror. This is not a personal attack. This is not a personal issue. Put people in there that know what they're doing. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that how you make a better community, how you make a better borough? 
You put the best people in the place to do their job. You don't cover up and you, and put the people at risk. Okay, so I won't go into the letter, but I think that the people need to know that and start asking questions. All right. The next thing, I have some other questions for Mr. Dillon that I want to. I sent to you earlier. I don't know if you were able to get these for me or not, but um, the wire transfer from the rink to the authority. Can I get a copy of that transfer, Mr. Dillon? Yes. All right. And the, the next question is, is the rec authority going to be abolished? Not to my knowledge, it's the council's decision. Okay. So what is it that they are doing right now that we would keep them? I think they're just like any other board that we have in the boroughs. A lot of boards don't do anything, but we still have them. I mean, we're not abolishing other boards because they don't meet. This board meets every month to discuss things throughout town. I mean, they may come up with a project or something that they want to do. But to abolish it makes no sense to me. Well, to keep them, what's the purpose of keeping them? The same reason we keep all our other boards and commissions. Well, the, the rec, well, the rec authority was on the same lines as the sewer authority. So if we sold the sewer authority, right, if we, if we sold the sewer authority, would we kill, still keep a sewer board? We can. I know, but would we? I don't know. Probably I don't not. Know. Yeah. I'm just so if you want to get rid of that board, Mr. Devine, you could put it on next month's agenda to be voted on. Well, it's, it's not the idea. You have the votes, and I understand. I just want to. I just want to know why. What is the purpose of it? What What is their role? What are they doing for us? I think I just answered that. You didn't say anything. All you said was they might have a project, or they like every other board. They don't meet. What, what is their? They do meet. They do meet. Do, what do they discuss? What are they? Oh, no, I don't about? go to the meetings. Right, and we used to get a packet. Every month, we no longer get any of that information. So, another reason, again, transparency is 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 lacking. Meetings. I don't don't know they take care of the sewer department, Tony? Uh, they haven't been meeting. During they haven't COVID. been meeting, according to Mr. Dillon. Okay. Ralph, don't they take care of the sewer department also? No. They don't. The rec doesn't do anything with the sewer. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, the the other question is, Mr. Dillon, can I get? I know I asked you. I don't know if you did this this not. I mean, got this for me or not yet? But uh, I want to get the financials for the rec authority from 2018 to the current month of 2021. And I know you're busy, but have you been able to get that for me? Uh, yes. All right. Thank you. Um, what is the name of the ownership group of the Mill Run project? they take possession of the the property I'm not sure six months ago or so six so months about and then were you able to get in touch with Angie the deed, the deed when they took over took the deed. yeah where I, we I'll were able to the exact date I, well I think it was about six months yeah that's fine I just want to get it a ballpark um were you able to see if Angie could find out how much had they paid so far in Borrow taxes. <coughs> their, their tax bill for this quarter, uh, I don't think it's been paid yet. Okay. Uh, they have until the end of the year to pay it. The rest of the property will be lean. That's all. I can get that these, off you. A lot of these questions, <coughs> Mr. Devine, you probably could have emailed the manager. You did. Again, Mr. DiGiuseppe, I love you jumping in when you don't know anything they were already emailed that's why we're discussing them okay
Um, you know, there are some other things, but I will wait until I don't need to finish anything else. That's all I have for today. Just a couple things real quick. One, uh, talking about the summer programs, the Lions summer concerts have started again. Uh, they're back from 6 to 8 o'clock. Uh, first Friday, we're still discussing. The Juneteenth event starts this Saturday from noon to 5 p.m. They're starting the first one in Bristol Borough. Uh, go out and support that organization. Uh, the Mill Street Run will be... Uh, on again this year for September 11th. We have a tall ship coming in September 8th, and in conjunction with the tall ship, it's not going to be Italian Day this year, but the food for three days will be provided and sponsored by the Lions Club. So the ship will be there for three days. The Lions Club will be down there for three days. Everything should work out. Perfect. Historic Bristol Day is back on for October 16th, and the doo-wop concert is scheduled for the third Saturday in September. We did not get any contracts in yet from the groups. Hopefully that should happen this week. Uh, and I did mention Juneteenth, right, for this Saturday, yeah. and the chief mentioned it. Okay, so right now we're through our work session. I don't think we have anything on the agenda, so... I'm going to go right into the regular meeting and just real quick, again, anybody on this side for public participation? Anybody on this side? So that ends public participation. So we have a few presentations tonight. I'm going to start with the theater. should only take a couple minutes. Try to start moving this along, Betty. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for letting us speak quickly. Um, for anybody who doesn't know us, I'm Amy Kesar. Uh, I'm one of the two co-producing directors of Bristol Riverside Theater. Ken is the other one. Um, and uh, first, I just want to thank the council and um, the entire town of Bristol. Obviously, this has been an incredibly hard year for everybody and every business. Uh, but certainly for the theater, it's been an incredibly challenging year. Um, and we are very proud to have come out of it as strong and healthy as we are and ready to reopen, and that would not be true if it were not for this community and the incredible support of this community for that theater and uh, the council as well. So thank you so, so much for, for helping us get through this, uh, which brings us to what's coming next. After 15 months of being closed, we launched our summer concert series this past Saturday night. It was wonderful. We had a great turnout. We had five more concerts this uh, summer come out, bring a bit in the basket, Sit under the stars, hear some great music. We're going to start this weekend. It's going to be the Broadway Memories concert, great Broadway songs from the golden age of Broadway, and then four more concerts after that all summer long. In September, the theater reopens right here at 120 Radcliffe. We're so happy. We'll have a full season, five shows. Our first show opens end of September, so we'll see you there. We're looking forward to, to entertaining you again once again after all this time. So so God, Amy. And two programs that we're, I'm really excited to say are, are back are the $5 Bristol Ticket Nights. We'll be back starting in September with the thanks, the thanks to this council for making that possible. So any Bristol resident can come to any of the previews, the first two performances of any of our five shows for just $5. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Art Rageous, the summer camp, uh, is back this summer in person, in the school, we are fully enrolled. The kids are excited, the parents are excited, the staff is excited, Miss Denise is excited, everyone's <laughs> excited. It's gonna be a great summer. Um, so both of those Bristol, Bristol sort of staples are back. So just so you know, we appreciate all your hard work and dedication. It's been a long time before uh, to bring these programs back. And on behalf of Borough Council, somebody wants to come up. We have a check for $10,000. This is for your so continued that. effort and work. This $10,000 check supports the borough residents. Like Amy said, $5 uh, 
they could go there and see a show instead of spending 40 or $50 for the first uh, two nights of every performance. So the borough residents do take advantage of that. A lot of senior citizens do. So we're glad to help. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a quick question. Could you just let everyone know about the summer concerts, where they can get the tickets? So you can get tickets to the summer concert on our website, brtstage.org, brtstage.org. Uh, or you can call, um, and tickets are also available on site. This summer, uh, we are at the new amphitheater in the township on Bath Road. You can also buy them in person as well. Great. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, two things. The first one is I appreciate you guys being there. And the show that the $5 uh, show we went to, I don't even know when it was now. It's got to be over a year and a half ago. But it was the one woman show, one of the Wayne sisters, the oh, one who did it. Yeah. So that was awesome. And then the second question I have, what is going to be the show in September? It's called Murder for Two. It's a murder mystery performed by two people. They play the piano for each other. They sing. One guy acts out 13 murder suspects. The other guy is the detective. It's a hilarious night of theater. So it would be, it'd be a good time. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all Thanks so, much. so much. Thank you for the time. OK. Uh, Amy? Good evening. My name's Amy McElvain. I'm with the Academic Oversight Committee. I'm here on behalf of Gene Williams, who had a conflict on his schedule. We wanted, the message that Gene wanted me to communicate was our, how appreciative we are for, of the partnership with the Bristol Borough Council. Um, we are tremendously grateful for all the support that we've received over the 10 years of our existence. The, the purpose of the AOC is to um, support the needs academically and socially of the students attending the Bristol Borough Schools and including St. Mark Parochial School, and we have three learning centers. With me this evening are Mary Jeswaldi, who is the president of the Academic Oversight Community Board, and also Evan Van Shea, who is the program coordinator and director of the summer camp, and they'll be talking to you about a few things. Hi, uh, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Evan Vanche. I'm a program director for 21st Century here in Bristol Barrow School District. I just want to bring you some additional information about this year's summer camp. We are fully back in person. As of today, we have 236 students registered for our summer camp. This is across three sites. We have 50 at St. Mark's, 24 at Bristol Middle, and 162 at Snyder Girardi Elementary School. Uh, elementary school. Um, this number will go up as well for the high school as uh, the end of the year re report cards go out. Uh, the high school guidance counselor sends out um, invitations for credit recovery for those students who need a little additional support in academics. Um, so our camps run June 28th to August 5th. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's included in each of the programs. We are so lucky to have at Snyder Girati not over not only an academic program, but also a recreation program which includes athletics and performing arts. Probably the only area that has such a wonderful free program open to all our parents. Um, we have monitors in each of the classrooms rising first through fifth at Snyder Girati with certified teachers who will be working with small groups of students. And especially after this last year, there are a lot of gaps that they need to fill in and this, this will work out beautifully for the students and their parents. Um, in reading, we will be continuing our foundations program, which we use during the year. We'll be doing that with our rising first, second, and third graders. And we'll be working on comprehension strategies uh, with our third, fourth, and fifth graders. The AOC purchased Common Core Pennsylvania Standard math books for all the students in the summer program. Again, working on basic skills and any gaps that the students might have. Uh, St. Mark's will have their own program this year. This is the first time. And that's a <laughs> wonderful addition to the 21st century program. Uh, that will be for rising first through eighth graders. They will also be working on English language arts, math, recreation, and clubs. Our middle school will be doing two days of math, two days of ELA working on their summer 
reading extra projects. And um, as Evan said, our high school program will be working on credit recovery. And the goal of all of these programs is to get the students ready for back to school in September. So we thank I, you for your continued support. Well, Mary, thank you because I know how hard you and Amy and this team works with all the fundraising and things you do uh, for the kids of this town. So Mrs. Rodriguez has a check to support your organization, which we do every year, and at roughly around $10,000 too. Yes, and we appreciate everything you do, but I also would like to congratulate you on your retirement, on your hard work, and always taking care of our kids. Thank you. you want to give just a quick one minute on Bristol Day, or you want to come back for that? Because I know you run, just come back. Well, I just, <laughs> before you change gears, I, I have a one page fact sheet for all the members of council. Oh, okay. okay. While Amy's handing that out, I'll just squeak in that uh, the borough council has approved us going forward with Bristol Day. We have already started meeting and October 16th from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock. We will be having our annual Bristol Day and the Bristol Day car show over at Snyder Girati. So I'll be back with more information if you don't mind. Thank you. The other thing I wanted to just squeak in here on Wednesday, we have our next mural project in Bristol on Otter Street at the Harris Comfort Building at 11 o'clock. The theme of that mural by uh, Jean-Marc Dubis is an educational theme since that was the second schoolhouse in Bristol Borough, which many of us didn't know. Um, and uh, Harold Michener will be there representing the Bristol Cultural and Historical Foundation and Mrs. Helkowski's gifted and enrichment students will be doing a little play about the Otter Street building. So if anyone can come out for that, we'd love to see you. Okay, before you leave, Amy, uh, just to drop back real quick about recreation. We've been meeting, the last meeting we had was with Amy and Mary was there and Jean Williams, school board members and members of council discussing recreation for, for throughout the town. So I think we have made a decision that we're probably going to hire a recreation director. It's like we're leaning that way, uh, but we're not going to compete with one another. We're going to try to work together on the summer program that you have, maybe picking something up in September, October, and then working in the Little League and everything else. So if we get one, the school board is, we're working hand in hand right now, which is great. Mr. Ciccoletti couldn't, be nicer. I mean, to me, everything's going in the right direction. I think in the next, hopefully by the end of this year, we have a complete program to start the following year with one director and every recreation that takes place in Bristol Borough will be sanctioned under between the Grundy Foundation, the school district, and council. There will be no other recreation out there unless we sponsor it. So I think that's the direction we want to move in. Sounds like a Thanks. step in the right direction. Right, Amy? Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, Bob, you want to go next or you going to hurry? Whatever you want to listen a little bit more? Uh, I wanna, can, I, can I deal with Mascara first? We had Mascara come in tonight because I know there's a lot of issues with trash throughout town. And I thought that, you know, our residents. Uh, been complaining and they have every right to complain about what's going on. So we asked Mascara to come in this evening to give us an update on what's going on. Okay. Mr. President, um, uh, thank you for inviting me here tonight. Uh, and of course, I'll interact with anybody from the audience from Bristol. Obviously, they passed for the service. And uh, we want to thank you for the contracts over the years, and we look uh, forward to continue servicing Bristol Borough. Uh, the first thing I want to assure Bristol, uh, Bristol Borough is that we, Mascaro, possesses uh, the resources of the best resources of any trash hauling company uh, in the East. Um, 
I can compare our resources to waste management. I can compare our resources to Republic Services. Uh, so it's not a question of resources. We have the landfill space. Uh, we have the operating centers. We have the finest recycling center um, in the east, in Birdsboro, Pennsylvania, uh, where your recyclables are processed. Uh, so all of those, all of those valued, um, all of those valued uh, resources we have, and continuing to continue to have right through um, the current uh, situation uh, with COVID. What we're missing and why we are having issues, not only servicing Bristol Borough, but servicing 15 other communities in the, in the Delaware Valley, including, including Upper Southampton Township, Lower Southampton Hampton Township, Northampton Township, uh, Warminster Township uh, in Bucks County, and many others in Montgomery County and uh, Delaware County, is that uh, due to the current crisis with manpower, um, um, person power, whatever you want to whatever you want to call it, uh, there is a shortage of labor in the economy due to COVID. Obviously, it's great to be out again. It's great. It's great to be um, uh, doing the things we we were doing, but with the current situation with COVID. Uh, as you know, the government continues uh, to ass assist uh, people with their unemployment. There's an extra $300 coming each week to people on unemployment. The, the labor pool is at its worst. And I've been in the industry 40 years. I just turned 69. I understand the economy. I got my undergraduate degree in economics. And I can tell you, this is the worst labor situation that I don't. Th I think anybody in this room has ever seen. Uh, as you know, there's there's many many uh, locations, whether they be restaurant locations, whether they be other commercial locations, that there are they are closing up because they can't find labor. So we are uh, out there every day picking up trash. We just don't have enough labor to go around. And it's causing us to be late in communities. But we are picking up the trash. We are picking up the recycling. We are picking up the yard waste. We are actually spending six days to seven days every week on our five-day-a-week uh, uh, on our five-day-a-week normal routes. Uh, this will probably continue. I'm not going to. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This will probably continue right through the summer till September 1st. I believe that's when the unemployment, the additional unemployment, is is uh, being being uh, stopped. So I have here tonight with me a contingency plan that I'm going to hand to Mr. Dillon, which basically says that when the residents put out their trash, expect it to be picked up on the normal collection day. I know that you've seen our trucks in here late. Uh, after six, sometimes later into the night, on Tuesdays and Fridays. But if by chance the trash isn't picked up, leave it out there. We'll pick it up the next day. Uh, the recycling, the same thing. If the recycling isn't picked up, leave it out there. We'll pick it up the next day. And the yard waste, uh, the same. I also want to mention to you that we've never, we've never been uh, policemen in Bristol Borough, we don't shortchange the residents. We never shortchange the residents. We pick up all your trash, okay? We pick up all your trash. We don't just let it sit there at, at, at your household. I'm sure there's some instances where there may be, may be situations that, you know, somebody is not abiding by the contract but we don't count bags, we pick up the trash. I've been away, made aware too that in the downtown area with these businesses back open and thriving, that there's, there's tremendous amount of trash in the downtown area that we've been picking up. So I want you to know that. And even during COVID, I want you to know that 
because of COVID, a lot of people have stayed home over the past year. The trash has been probably 15, 20, even 25 percent heavier than it had been in the past uh, because people weren't traveling, weren't going to the shore, some, some of the normal things that you have done in the past. So we, I come here tonight to assure you your trash is going to be picked up this summer, uh, albeit perhaps later in the day, perhaps uh, the next morning, but we're going to pick up that trash, pick up that recycling, pick up that yard waste. So now I stand here ready to answer any questions that uh, the residents have, that uh, the board has uh, uh, regarding uh, Mascaro and its uh, and its commitment to the community. So th the reason I asked Sam to come in or a representative from Mascara tonight because I think they're getting a, a bad deal throughout town. And I understand the residents are tired of, you know, their trash not getting picked up, but there's only so much you can do. Yeah. And you're doing the best you can. Mr. Dillon emails Will, who's on the route every day. They were in town a couple of weeks ago at quarter to 12 on a Friday night, still picking up trash. Right. And these guys have lives too that they got, you know, families to get home to. They're working hours right. from four or five in the morning right. until seven, eight, nine o'clock at night, sometimes later. I just think that the people need to understand that there are no other companies out there that are going to do any better than you're going to do. And that's the thing that's, you know, disheartening because they say, oh, well, you should have not gave Mascara another contract. You shouldn't have gave Mascara this. There's no company out there that's going to service us better than you're serving Bristol Borough, in my opinion. People are unhappy. I understand that. They want their trash picked up. But I think we need to make people understand that if it's not picked up on your normal day, you will be back the next day to pick it up. Yes. And if it's missed, email Mr. Dillon because on Sunday, they missed an alley again in my ward, and it's happening frequently. Okay. They missed it again, and they came back Sunday to pick up that alley. So you guys go beyond what you're supposed to do to, to make sure this is right. right. A friend of mine lives in Newtown. They went from two days a week to one day a week. They said, we're not coming two days. We don't have the manpower anymore. It's not your company. I don't want to say what company right. it is, but it's not just here. It's everywhere. Yes. So, you know, I get tired of everybody bad mouth and mascara. So I just want you to know that I know what you're doing. You're doing an outstanding job, and I'm happy with right. with your company. Right. This same, this same, uh, uh, Mr. President, this same uh, letter is going to all 15 communities. And by the way, we're throughout Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, our situation isn't as dire. In, in other areas, up in Berks County, up in Allentown, uh, up in the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area, is, is, isn't as dire as it is in the Delaware Valley. Uh, but this letter is going out to 15 communities in the Delaware Valley uh, uh, because uh, you know it, it is it is a crisis. It it, it uh, it's an emergency time. I mean it, it's a crisis. I seen your signs on 95 offering 85 thousand dollars yes. for truck yes. drivers. Yes. So. Yes. Called, a matter of fact, I think you spoke to, that's Mr. Harvey, one of our commissioners. You even spoke to their, the commissioners about prisoners. And we yes. can't, they're, they're can't even, you can't get nobody to work anymore. No. So the labor pool is at an all-time low. Well, we've put, so. in, the past, in the past two years, we've put hiring offices in uh, Pottstown, off-site hiring offices. We've rented space, and we also put an office in Willow Grove, right on the right on the rail line into Philadelphia. We have an office in Willow Grove, right at the end of the rail rail line, near the uh, Willow Grove Mall, uh, that we we didn't have two years ago. We didn't have it. In fact, in fact, that we put it in about a year to 15 months ago. We didn't have it there, and now we have approximately. 25 to 35 workers that are showing up in Willow Grove, God forbid if we didn't have that, that are showing up in Willow Grove every morning and the trucks, our trucks are leaving Bridgeport, coming through Willow Grove and, and grabbing, grabbing employees. 
whether they be whether they be drivers or, or helpers. So we're do, we're doing we're doing everything we can uh, uh, to deal deal with the crisis, and we see we see uh, we see better times ahead uh, again in the in the in the, uh, the early September. Thanks. Anybody have any questions for Sam? I don't have a question. I just do have a comment that I know a lot of people get nervous around 5, 30, 6 o'clock when the trash is still out. I get a yes. lot of phone calls. Yes. But we are able to get in touch with Mr. Dillon or Wilbur. Right. And immediately it comes back where the next day they take care of it. And I want to thank you for that. All right. I really I appreciate, appreciate it. it. I appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, thank All you. Right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Good now, since Mr. Harvey said age before beauty, <laughs> so you know, uh, probably for about six months or longer, we've been working with members of SEPTA to try to get our Bristol train station redone. I think the theory was Croydon was we redone, Levittown was we redone, and they skipped over Bristol. So. Uh, Everybody knows there's no secret that Mr. Dion is the chairman of SEPTA, and I'm very, very good friends with him. And now Mr. Cardisco is on the board of SEPTA, and I grew up with him. So I think we have a little pool right now to try to hopefully get something done at our train station. So with us tonight is Kate O'Connor, who is the chief engineer for SEPTA, and Bob Lunn who's the Deputy General Manager for SEPTA. So both of them are here tonight, along with Mr. Cardisco, if the three is want to go to the podium. And we met several times, and I think we met, I didn't want to bring this up before the election, because I didn't want to make it political. Uh, they're only doing this because it's political. But uh, Katie, when did we meet? A couple weeks ago again? Yeah, mm -hmm. a couple weeks And ago. we did some drawings to present to council, and I'll present this again next month to there are other members of council who, who's not here. And we came up with a plan that uh, she's going to present to you. And the biggest thing was ADA accessibility. And we talked about elevators. And we decided, I mean, I personally think it's a bad idea because elevators become bathrooms. They become uh, places for people to, to do things in that we don't want done. So we talked about changing the elevator to a ramp. What that's going to do on Garden Street is probably eliminate half of the brush that's there because it's going to work from Garden towards Jefferson. It's not going to go that far. It'll probably go to the middle of the next block. As far as what is there in the fence and everything that everybody's been complaining about for years, they have nothing to do with that. They're only here for SEPTA. They don't, you know, uh, Conrail, I guess, owns all that ground. Amtrak owns all that ground. So that's a whole different issue. But, uh, Katie, why don't you explain, and you have a pointer I gave you. Sure. I know it's hard to see uh, what, we're, what we're proposing. So thanks to the Borough Council for having us here tonight. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, as the council president spoke to, so this is the plan for our long-term capital improvements for the stations. I can barely see it from that's here. A long shot, sure yeah. <laughs> that's a long shot, yeah. That's a long. That's a long way, yeah. It is. I mean, I can hit it with a, with this, but so what we're talking about here is we have six-car high-level platforms for ADA accessibility. That's level boarding, so that people that are handicapped in wheelchairs can get directly onto the train. And it also shortens the dwell time at the station. And then at the end, if you can see anything here, there is a low level platform. That's just for emergency use in case Amtrak has to let people off if they're using the inner tracks so that people have the ability to exit the train and get out of the station. And you can see on either platform, we have a ramp at one end and a ramp at the other end, and then three sets of stairs. I'm just guessing at what I'm circling here. You want to come up, Katie? Stairs on all the platforms. That's OK. Um, so that's in code compliance. Because of the length of the platforms and the ramps, we would actually end up tying into Jefferson on this end of the station. Um, so this is the, the bigger capital project. Right. It's to make it ADA accessible. We are, in the meantime, making 
modifications to bring it to a state of good repair so that we don't have to wait for the capital project to get here. So there's a number of things that we're going to be doing starting after July 4th. Um, we're going to be cleaning and painting the pedestrian tunnel out there. We're going to be making repairs to the, um, Landing. the stairs, the concrete stairs, adding new hand railings, then up at the platform level. We'll be replacing the beams at the bottom, at the back of the platforms. We'll be cleaning and painting the remaining platform framing, um, doing steel repairs to the canopies and cleaning and painting the canopies themselves, putting in all new tactile at the, at the edge of the platform um, or yellow strip, and then uh, site furnishings, um, uh, all new guardrails or hand railings that are along the platform. Um, basically just bringing this to a state of good repair so that it's less waiting time before we get to the bigger capital project. So in this capital, not to interrupt you, but in this capital project, <coughs> there's more, uh, what do you call them, where you're staying in? The, there's going to be two. There's going to be passenger shelters. Right, shelters. About Instead of one range? that we have now. Yes. The ramp will go all the way down towards the parking lot, and there'll be another shelter there. So it'll be two on each side, yep. and there'll be three sets of stairs going up to this to these platforms. That's correct. Again, that's long term. Congressman Fitzpatrick voted. They voted for this bill, what Friday or something, Johnny? Yeah. I think Friday <laughs> they voted for it. Now the money still got to right, go to other right. So we're hoping that if they get this money, you know, we put in for a few million dollars for this project. And then this year, I'll switch this cave for you. Sure. So this is more like 3D. Right, so you, so you can, can see. see. Because of the grade change between where the platforms are and where the parking lot is, That's how obviously it these are pretty long ramps that we have to take because you have to comply with the grade requirements for the ramps themselves. But I and this is, just, this is just conceptual at this right. point. We're, we're starting to work into our design, but we wanted to bring something to you folks so that you could see here's what we're steering towards for the so station improvement. Hopefully if we get to this point, we're going to have a hell of a train station. Yeah. And Absolutely. it's proven that with a good train station, you attract more people into town, property values go up, and it just, everything falls into place. Yes. So, well, Mr. Kurdiska, why don't you talk as a member of SEPTA and yeah, give us uh, Let me uh, first thank uh, Commissioner Harvey, uh, as well as the other two commissioners, uh, for appointing me and nominating that, me to That the microphone. Show. You got to go over there so they can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Much, yeah. much better? Okay. I, I just uh, said that I wanted to personally thank uh, you know, Commissioner Harvey, Marsegli, and DiGirolamo. Uh, ironically, it was even Commissioner DiGirolamo, right, uh, Bob, that uh, put my name in nomination. So it was a bipartisan appointment, uh, to which I'm very appreciative. Uh, in a short uh, period of time, I find working with, uh, obviously, the chairman, you know, uh, Chairman Dion, and at least identifying areas throughout Bucks County with the assistance of the commissioners as to things that need to be uh, obviously dealt with. And, and I can tell you, my first trip to uh, County Mac Stadium was a result of going on that train station. So I got a bonus that day. I got to ride on the train and I got to see the game. And Richie Allen hit a home run. But uh, so I, I guess the folks that, uh, that know me know where my heart lies. Uh, it will never leave once you're there's a part of Bristol that never goes away and <coughs> I'm excited about the project and, and the work that they're doing to achieve that I can tell you we have the money so what we intend to do will be done um, hopefully we have some benefit from COVID and, and hopefully some other resources that you know this is going to be something that's happening um, a couple of things that I, I also want to mention to, to people that are here that, you know, yes, I am sitting as a board member for SEPTA. If anyone at any time has an issue related to SEPTA that in somehow impacts 
this particular town, you're free to call me. Uh, it's easy to access me. Just look under lawyers in Bucks County and uh, we'll watch television every once in a while. I guess that gets on there as well. But uh, you'll be able to get a number to be able to reach me. And I assure you that if it's important to you in Bristol, it's unequivocally important to myself. And I'll speak for Chairman Dion as well. As it relates to the Amtrak situation, I will reach out to the chairman tomorrow in our daily communication and advise him that I wish that uh, we will send a letter from SEPTA to Amtrak requesting that they address this issue. And it won't just be left there. So I will you know, communicate to council, the, the president of council here, and communicate and let you know what the status of that is and what we find so you can communicate to the rest of the council members, especially obviously those that uh, represent the North Ward. So that uh, I can assure you that when that project is completed, it's something that we're all going to feel very good about. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to working with council, uh, as well as the county commissioners, and doing whatever we can for a great community. And I got to say, to compliments to you that uh, you know, my mother's still here at 90, and uh, so when I'm here, the town has never looked better. So uh, I thank you all. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bob, you want to add anything or? No, we look forward to uh, working with the community and the council uh, on this project. And we'll be back as the design uh, progresses. Do a good job. Right, Kate? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, it was raining very hard out there, so. <laughs> Save the best for last, Bob. Thank you. It's fine. I was sitting here. Um, I was here more than a year ago uh, after I got sworn in in early January of 2020. Um, I made it sort of my mission to kind of go around and, and go to as many town meetings, township meetings as I could. I got to about a dozen. Uh, there's 54 municipalities in Bucks. I got to about a dozen of them and everything shut down. Um, and this is actually the first one I've been to since then, live. So. Um, Happy to be here, uh, as always. I appreciate you giving me some time. Um, I'm really here to talk about the pandemic uh, and specifically about vaccines. Um, certainly, we all waited a very, very long time to try and get to this point, uh, and, and the vaccines obviously helped us do that. Uh, the county has dispensed, um, no exaggeration, a, a couple hundred thousand doses of vaccine uh, throughout Bucks. Uh, that's not counting you know, individual pharmacies, hospitals, doctor's offices, et cetera. Um, as you probably know, we had the Lower Bucks campus of the community college as one of our sites. Uh, that did close a couple weeks ago uh, because the college basically needed it back. Um, you know, the building back, they had some work they needed to start doing to get ready for, uh, you know, spring or fall rather when they're back in session. The Shawnee Mall is still open. It is no appointment necessary. Walk in, uh, get your dose. Um, it is right by the food court in Shawnee Mall. And there are also a lot of, you know, pharmacies now have it and, and, and doctor's offices. Um, the reason I'm here tonight really is, is because a week ago, the county received a report from the state uh, breaking down essentially by zip code in Bucks County uh, the percentage of people who had been vaccinated. Uh, and the 1907 zip code, which obviously the borough and parts of the township, um, is one of the lowest. Nice. Uh, it's uh, third lowest, uh, quite frankly. Uh, so it's about 44% of uh, adults in um, the 19007 zip code have been vaccinated. Um, you know, obviously, we want that to be higher. Uh, and so I just want to make sure people are aware of that. 
you know, to try and you know get people to, to, to get go get that dose. Um, you know, the evidence, if you're waiting to see, well, I'm not sure these are safe, you don't have to look at the rest of the country. You know, literally hundreds of thousands of doses just, you know, in this county uh, have been given out. Uh, and we have seen none of the major things. We've given out mostly Pfizer. We give out a lot of Moderna. We've given out thousands and thousands of Johnson Johnson uh, doses. We haven't seen any of the things that, you know, the nightmare scenarios people hear about. Um, our health department... Uh, is still running, or we're still running sites in different parts of the county. Uh, we have transitioned in a couple ways, and one of the big reasons why I came here. Um, we still have, as I said, the Chamonix Mall in the lower end of the county, but we've started transitioning now to doing pop-up clinics. And uh, we're in communications with different townships and boroughs, and it's one of the reasons why I came here. Um, at any point, obviously I don't need an answer right now, <laughs> but if you want our health department to come set up a tent, you know, spend a couple of hours giving doses to anybody who shows up. You let us know when, you let us know where. It's that simple. You know, they'll come and do it. Um, you know, they're doing it in some cases in firehouses, uh, in some areas. Um, obviously, you know, the big cultural festivals would have been perfect, uh, but obviously not doing a lot of those. I don't know about, I didn't know about the Ju uh, Juneteenth uh, this weekend. I don't know if we have something scheduled for this Saturday or not. Uh, okay. All right, so yeah, it's, it's you know, we're, we're willing to do it and we'll come back as many times as you need us. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention is we spent for the past, and it hasn't gotten a lot of press, which I guess is probably my fault because I'm supposed to make sure that happens, but over the past month or so, maybe even six weeks, uh, we vaccinated hundreds of people throughout the county who were homebound. Uh, these are people who called the county, got their name on the homebound list, uh, and we sent people out to them. From our health department, in some cases, there were off-duty EMTs who were working as volunteers for us, off nurses on their off-duty, you know, working as volunteers for the health department to go out and deliver, uh, you know, administer doses to people all over the county. Um, that is something else you can do, and I'll give you the number, uh, which is also, if you go to the Bucks County website, which is buckscounty.org, you'll see a vaccine information button. Uh, you can click on that and get information. But the phone number to call, if you, if you yourself want to have somebody come and, and administer a dose because you're homebound or you know somebody who is, is 1-800-383-0371. So 1-800-383-0371. You can get your name on that list <coughs> so we can send somebody out to you. Um, we are doing Pfizer and Johnson Johnson, uh, trying to, you know, what people are comfortable with. As I said, you know, the statistics, you know, forget about data and the rest of the country. I mean, it, it almost doesn't matter. What, what's happening here in Bucks County, all the numbers are moving in the right direction. Positivity rate is way, way down. Hospitalizations are way, way down. We are still losing about one person a day uh, to COVID. Uh, it's about average. Uh, but what I can tell you is that over the past few weeks, not a single person who's passed away from COVID has been vaccinated. Mm. Every single person who's passing away is someone who has not been vaccinated. Uh, and about three weeks ago, I just remember this statistic, we had 50 people in hospitals across Bucks County with COVID. 49 of them had not been vaccinated. Uh, one person who was vaccinated who was hospitalized was a person who had real, real serious health issues uh, aside from the COVID. So that's the statistic for here, right here. Forget about other states. That's what's happening in Bucks County. So. We, we want to make sure that things stay safe. We want to be able to open schools up in the fall. We want to make sure we have, you know, Bristol Day. We want to make sure that we have a, you know, a, a Christmas parade, you know, and so those kinds of things. We need people to get vaccinated. So right. any, any assistance you can give, and like I said, we'll work with the chief. So why the don't we uh, come up with a couple dates? I mean, our borough building, our borough public works building is available. Mm -hmm. We could advertise it on our TV. Yep. Maybe get some press out of it so people in town know mm -hmm. we could put up this hotline for vaccines if they're homebound mm -hmm. and pick a couple dates throughout the summer. And if you guys want to come down, you're more than welcome. Mm -hmm. But we'll advertise, try to get some yeah, something well, out, yeah, you know, Facebook, we'll, right. we'll do whatever we have to do to let them know you're going to be in Bristol. The county's going to be here from this time to this time, you know. Show up and get it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, get it. And I know Chief Henry works for uh, his communications with Audrey Kenny, who's the head of our emergency management, and she helps coordinate that. So you can work it, you know, through the chief, and he can do it directly through through uh, our emergency management agency. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, Bob, what's the magic number? You said 44% is being allowed. What would be what would be that magic number that you would like to see? We've got in, you know, for the county itself, ages 12 and up, um, about 50% of the county, 12 and up, is fully vaccinated. <clears throat> about 65, 66% have had at least one dose. Again, ages 12 and up. So we're not even looking at adults. Right. We're looking 12 and up. Um, and we've seen a lot of 12 and, and kids between 12 and 16 start coming in as soon as the as soon as the Pfizer was authorized. We saw them. We saw that influx. Um, I mean, obviously the governor set a market 70% for vaccinations, um, and you know we we just want to hit that number. There's there's areas of the county. There's zip codes where it's very high. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's a couple zip codes, and, and you know, and there's a couple in the upper end of the county, and, and you know, Croydon, Ben Salem, some of the Levittown zip codes are low as well. So. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for our commissioner? Thank you for coming in. On another note, I know you buried your uncle today, and it was a tough day for the Tosti and Lolly family. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming in during these difficult times. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your you. time. Again. Does anybody else have anything? Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion by Betty, second by Mr. Gorman. Meeting adjourned.